This is a story about vultures, hawks, and COVID-19. All right, guys, you're going to need to um, bear with me here for a second, because this is going to be a super roundabout way of talking about the pandemic. But along the way, there are probably going to be some more puns, and there's definitely going to be some cool birds of prey. So, yeah, let's uh, let's rewind. During the winter of 2019, but California winter, so better. I traveled up the California coast to Marysville to shoot a documentary about a little place called West Coast Falcon. Now, this is an actual falconry center offering classes and hands-on experiences with, well, falcons, of course, but owls and hawks too, and there's even a very kind vulture named Zope. Now, the falconers protect and preserve these species while forming intimate bonds with these deeply intelligent birds. And as fun as that is, it's also a bit of a bummer that hawks are only one of several species protected there because otherwise I could have called this a uh, hawkumentary. But anyway, West Coast Falconry is run by master falconer and all-around powerhouse Kate Martin, who can be seen here posing with a Eurasian eagle owl, which happens to be the largest species of owl in the world with a wingspan of about six feet. Oh, and quick side note on that, actually, um, eagle owl chicks kinda look like the product of a love affair between cotton candy and a very handsome tumbleweed. So anyway, I went to West Coast Falconry with the Stanford Storytelling Project, which is a student group based down the coast who wanted to make a podcast about Kate Martin and her fabulously fine family of falcons. They interviewed her while I filmed the birds, hoping to add their audio to a video piece of my own. It ended up turning into one of those classic camera guys surrounded by hawks and podcasters type situations. But then two things happened. When I was nine years old, I read this book called My Friends. First, a couple of days after we got back to Stanford, we realized a lot of the audio was lost. Now that was a real bummer. I mean, I thought for a while a silent film about Birds of Prey could be kind of cool and maybe sort of old-timey and artsy, maybe, like this. Eleanor, I've always loved you, Eleanor. Johnson, you're just a regular hawk and I'm... Well, I'm a falcon, Johnson. I don't know, but then I thought that bit could only go on for so long, and plus, like, we all know Eleanor and Johnson would get together in the end, so I never went for it. Instead, the Falcon footage just sat there for the next year and nothing really became of it. And then the second thing happened. And we reached another tragic milestone today, the most reported coronavirus deaths in a single day, well over- The uh, center did say that this outbreak would last at least um, uh, two years. In my view, horrific images of people in spring break in Florida and the beach as if nothing's- Possibly no graduation ceremony, lifelong memories. So by late February, things fell apart really fast. I mean, within about three days, we went from be careful on campus to mandatory evacuation by the end of that week. So my dad drove nine hours overnight to pick me up, and to this day, I haven't been back to campus. At home, it's quiet. We do family yoga and watch the news, but you know, all the while, it's slowly dawning on me that my college experience might be over. You know, sometimes it makes it really hard to find some beauty in all of this. And usually art would help me do that, but it's kind of hard to make a movie by yourself. And then it hit me. Long ago, in a world where people hugged and parties raged and smiles were left uncovered, a young man journeyed north to wield his camera in the face of falcons. There was footage. And where there's footage, there's life. So let's go back to Zopi. He's a lesser yellow-headed vulture, and this species lacks a syrinx, which means Zopi can't vocalize like other birds. He's quiet, like an interview longing for sound, or the world on lockdown. But Zopi's kind still lives. In fact, they endure, and I think we can learn from that. 
Now, yellow-headed vultures often fly alone like a lot of us are right now, but they don't let it tire them. Instead, they use thermals to keep up altitude, saving energy for when the moment's right. Now, I think this whole experience is a lot like a carcass. Delicious, right? Well, Zopi thinks so. Yellow-headed vultures get their life from the death of something bigger. And not only that, but when they eat it, they clean up a breeding ground for disease. And maybe our carcass is that vacation that was canceled, or her senior year that might never happen, or for some of us, a real death. And in the wake of that tragedy, I can only hope we learn to live like vultures. We can save energy, swoop down, and one bite at a time, we can do our best to clean it up. We can use tragedy as sustenance, as art even. And on the note of art, bear with me as I stretch just a little bit further. Now, you see those colors on the vulture's head? It reminds me of this painting by the artist Mark Rothko. He was a master at finding beauty in emptiness, and Rothko once said this. When I was a younger man, art was a lonely thing. Many of us who are driven to this life are desperately searching for those pockets of silence where we can root and grow. We must all hope to find them. And I would say now, we've been forced to find it. And now it's time to make the art. I think a hawk can help us figure out how we might do that. This is Mariposa. She's a Sonoran Harris hawk, and this is a species that's most successful when they hunt in groups. The same goes for us. The only way that we can find our carcass is by flying in tandem. It's about finding those you're stuck with and calling those you're stuck without. It's about finding someone to stand in front of that Rothko painting with you because these kind of things are impossible to figure out alone. Hawks soar above the chaos until their canvas is far below and it's just a patchwork of hues. We can learn from them how to look down and actually see. Now, every curse has a blessing, and ours might be the need to find beauty in the fine details. It's time to look into the void. This blank canvas so many of us never expected to see, and let the color wash over us. Let the single hues remind you of a summer day with company, a laugh, and the feeling of falling in love. Find these things and point them out. Help others swoop down and feed themselves. Find the art and share it. Now, Rothko once said, you've got sadness in you, I've got sadness in me. And my works are places where the two sadnesses can meet and therefore both of us need to feel less sad. Now, I, I know this probably sounds a little naive, but with a little footage and not much else, it's the most I can do. I, I was lost. And I looked back, and as best I could, I tried to find the art in something that fell apart. It wasn't perfect, but I used the footage. All that to say, if we find beauty in the moment, if we can learn the art of sadness, we can connect from separate rooms. And it just so happens there was one piece of audio salvaged from the original documentary. I'll leave you with this because it made me feel connected to a person I only met once and may never meet again. If this story made any sense at all, I hope her song does the same thing for you. <laughs> one I learned when I was a kid and I was just remembering it. So, and we'll see. I still, my voice is a little odd, so. I have seen the lark soar high at morn, heard his summer song in the blue. I have heard the black bird pipe his tune, the thrush and the linnet too. But there's none of them can sing so sweet, my singing bird, as you. Oh, 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 oh. 
my singing bird as you. I sing the lark so high at morn, heard his song up in the blue. 